Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation on a modern approach to traditional virology research. I am Lisa Berkeley from Nexlum Bioscience, where we have a team of experts in the science of cell counting and cell-based assays, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you would like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. I am excited to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Rushika Pereira from the Center for Vector-Borne and Infectious Disease at Colorado State University. For a complete biography on Dr. Pereira, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Pereira, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you to Nexalon for having me uh, here and uh, allowing me to uh, share my um, work. So uh, my laboratory has been heavily involved in antiviral testing against SARS-CoV-2, so I thought I'd share some of our experiences, but also really share some of the thoughts we have going forward in terms of um, breaking the uh, glass ceiling where antiviral therapeutics and interventions for infectious disease are concerned. And my laboratory is primarily interested in understanding the infinite interactions between pathogen and host and how those infinite interactions can be studied using systems biology. And in the antiviral uh, therapeutic space, I'm interested in using systems biology to understand how antivirals can alter or be altered by the metabolic interactions between pathogen and host. <clears throat> so as uh, COVID-19 hit, we had a, um, a plethora of people needing to test the antivirals. Colorado State University has a large BSL-3 space, and therefore we set up the space to uh, and a special respiratory virus wing to um, be able to cater to the world inventories uh, to test their, their products. So we've been involved in testing antivirals, disinfectants, inhalants, and biologics. So we share some of that information now. So we really took on three phases to our approach. The first phase was to establish um, conditions so that we can establish basic assays for antiviral testing to diversify platforms and be able to really produce uh, rigorous data. The second phase was to really develop synergy models for combination therapeutics, which is where uh, the therapeutic space is really strong uh, with specifics uh, like hepatitis C and HIV being um, productive in that space. And the, the third phase was to really understand virus-host interactions and how the metabolic space of a host might alter the efficacy of um, therapeutics and interventions. So I will go through the first phase and describe some of the assays we have developed. <clears throat> so for SARS, we are using the Washington uh, strain of SARS-CoV-2. Several cell lines have been uh, used in our assays, Vero, human hepatoma, Calu3, Keiko, and some primary cells. Our assays in vitro have included cytoprotection, cytotoxicity, black assays, high content imaging using the Celigo from Exelon, and QRT-PCR. We also have the capacity to, um, because we are a wet school, um, we have the capacity to use animal models. So my colleagues, Dick Bowen and Tony Shouns have been helping with hamster, deer mouse, and bat uh, animal models to test some of these antivirals. So some of the assays that we uh, started uh, producing for antiviral testing required that we demonstrate reproducibility. So in this slide on the left, what you can see is two operators and two independent experiments testing a FDA-approved drug. And you can see that we were able to really produce uh, rigorous uh, data uh, with a little uh, coefficient of variation. We also were able to demonstrate, as shown in the center, uh, FDA-approved drugs that, and be able to show that we can get the same EC50 as published. We also diversified our platforms. For instance, we're looking at virus output using plaque assays, 
virus uh, spread from cell to cell using immunofluorescence. And then we can also look at particle infectivity and genome replication using QRT-PCR. One of the important things that we established at the beginning was that a lot of the cell cytotoxicity assays that were being used in the field were not really appropriate for a lot of these antivirals and other compounds that we were testing, primarily because those compounds were um, affecting cell metabolism. <clears throat> and so we really wanted to focus just on the impact of the compound on the virus, rather than the impact of the compound on the cell or the uh, solvent on the cell. And so we had to establish, as you can see going to the, to the right, um, in orange is a higher cell density and in green is a lower cell density. And we discovered that AOPI staining using the Celigo from Exelom, as well as the neutral red assays were the best at determining um, cell cytotoxicity, uh, making sure that the compound was not affected by the assay. So I'll show you some data from disinfectants and inhalants. So there, are, there is a large repertoire of disinfectants that we're testing for uh, many different countries. And what we do with disinfectants as shown on the left is that we mix the disinfectant at different ratios with the virus and um, incubate it for several um, minutes or hours. And then we look to see how much virus is left by doing a plaque reduction assay. And as you can see, this specific disinfectant um, reduced virus um, infectivity significantly by several logs. This disinfectant has now gone on to FDA uh, approval. On the right is uh, inhalants. This is an inhalant that is normally used for TB patients. And so we tested it against SARS and we were able to show that it actually was antiviral. This inhalant has uh, gone on to phase two clinical trials. We've also worked with Nexalom to uh, look at visualization-based hydroput assays for antiviral triaging. Uh, in this case, I will uh, show you an example of a biologic. As you all might know, the Celigo is uh, a really powerful um, instrument to help us uh, evaluate a whole 96 square plate using visualization as to whether a compound can be antiviral or not. We can... Um, quantify cells uh, on a quadrant basis and um, establish whether the cells are alive or dead using staining. And we can also uh, stain for the virus. So this is uh, results from the Celigo. And in this case, uh, on the left graph, on the y-axis is cell count and on the x-axis is different uh, concentrations of the natural product. In blue is uh, dead cells. In green are live cells using AO staining. And then uh, in brown is virus titer. And what you can see as you move to the right on that x-axis, you can see that the red arrow is pointing to a concentration that is showing low dead cells, increased live cells, and low virus. So this means that if the cells are alive, the virus is uh, not replicating. And so uh, using Celigo imaging, we were able to demonstrate that um, AOPI staining can just tell us whether the drug is working or not. And on the right-hand side is a va validation of that assay using basic plaque assays, showing the exact same concentration is antiviral. And on the bottom is an image of our wells. And as you go to the right, you can see that you can um, look at more dead cell staining. <clears throat> We're also able to use the Celigo to look at cell-to-cell -cell spread. This was really important when uh, you're dealing with cells that do not output virus as efficiently as vero cells, for instance. So human cells um, don't output virus as uh, well, and so we need to look at the cells and how well the virus is replicating in those cells using antibodies against the virus. So this is an image of vero cells stained with the uh, antibody against the N protein. And you can see on the first panel is uh, infected cells, and on the other panels are controls. And so it's very clearly demonstrating that we can uh, look at cell-to-cell -cell spread using the Celigo. 
So we're continuing to test FDA-approved drugs, investigational compounds, SRNAs, biologics, and antibodies. I will now uh, describe a little bit of the work that we've done in developing synergy models for combination therapeutics. This manuscript uh, will be submitted for publication in the next few weeks. So one of the biggest antiviral, uh, one of the biggest uh, bottlenecks to the, in the antiviral space is that we use monotherapies. And when you use single drugs or monotherapies, you have to use a higher dose, and as a result, you have multiple complications where patients might have idiosyncratic hyperreactive, hyperreactive or tachyphylaxis in, um, reactions, and also it impacts comorbidities. And so the, the, as I said before, for hepatitis C and HIV, we have been able to really demonstrate um, that combination therapeutics are powerful. And so uh, the goal of this study was to really identify FDA-approved drugs that could be used in combination to uh, combat COVID-19. And so what you see here is some of our results. On the leftmost side, it describes our um, uh, scheme. So we have drug A, which is directly targeting the virus. Drug B is a host-targeted drug, and drug C is a host-targeted drug as well. And if you combine all three, you have multiple effects that you can expect. One is that it could be antagonistic. So drug A could be antagonized by the presence of B and C and any, in any combination. We could also have additive effects, which is okay, but not ideal, where you have drug A and B and C impacted in an additive fashion. What we're really looking for is a synergistic antiviral um, surface. And what that means is that the drug A uh, effective concentration will be uh, improved or dropped um, in the presence of drug B and C. So drug A's efficacy is increased by the presence of drug B and C and vice versa. So what we were able to show in the third panel that you see is that in blue is the virus control in orange is one drug, drug A. In uh, yellow is drug A plus B. And in green is drug A plus B plus C. And what you see here is that we can have a two and a half delay with the triple drug com uh, combination um, as measured by cytopathic effect. And on the more, uh, rightmost panel, you can see that this these uh, results are also uh, displayed in terms of infectious virus production and we get a six log drop in virus production in, uh, in the presence of three drugs versus two or a single drug. So this was really um, effective and it shows that you don't have to use a lot of drug if you do it in combination. So as the last um, set of uh, slides, I will describe where we are going um, in terms of our antiviral work and also in the therapeutic space. So I'm a systems biologist and really interested in metabolism and how host metabolism is altered by its uh, exposure types. So a human or a mosquito or any uh, organism that you're studying, uh, whether it's a plant or an animal, can be impacted by what it is exposed to, whether it's a, bitten by a mosquito vector whether it's infected by bacteria or viral pathogens, um, the microbiome, uh, vaccinations, and therapeutics, as well as the environment. <clears throat> and as you uh, are impacted by these exposures, in the, in, uh, historically, we've been studying how the genetics of the organism changes, how the transcriptome of the organism changes using transcriptomics, and how the proteome of the organism changes we've really paid little attention to what is downstream of all of these genes and transcripts and proteins, and that's metabolites. Metabolites are the final products or the intermediates of all biochemical pathways that are active at any given moment uh, in a human. And they are also the um, effectors of a phenotype. So they are directly related to your phenotype. So it's better to look at the active metabolic landscape of a human at any given point in time, and then be able to dial back and figure out which protein, which transcript, and which gene might be active. 
So basically, um, metabolites are intermediates and products of active biochemical pathways, so they are the most direct relationship to a phenotype. If you measure them, you can identify, uh, you can obtain much information, including uh, the, the fact that they are small molecule biomarkers of infection, tissue damage, your immune response, a pathogen-specific response, and treatment efficacy. So the measurement of these metabolites is a powerful conduit to get, gaining much information about your disease state. Most importantly, it's species independent. So glucose is glucose, whether it's in the human or the mouse or the monkey or the mosquito. And the most critical um, realization is that metabolites are what your drugs and inhibitors are. And so basically, by looking at what natural metabolites might be altered in your human body during infection, you're really identifying drugs that could be used to alter that metabolic landscape. So what we're really interested in is using systems biology-based therapeutics to look at drug interactions, so whether drugs can be synergistic or dissergistic. Drug metabolism, does a drug get broken down in your human body? And if it does, do those metabolites alter the therapeutic eff efficacy or the infectious uh, condition of the human? Uh, what do co-infections do? Uh, bacterial metabolites might impact therapeutic efficacy or infection state. Um, the microbiome, how its impact on drug mode of action, synergy and infection. And ideally, long term, what we're going towards is not every drug or combination is ideal for everybody. As you know, COVID-19 is plagued by the fact that there are many comorbidities that are exacerbating their conditions and the outcome. And so we really think that individualistic medicine, uh, by looking at a uh, human's uh, metabolic state and identifying what drug combinations might be useful, um, is the way to go. So with that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge and uh, our contributors. So Elena Liang was a, and Gabby Ramirez were undergraduates in my um, laboratory that had the amazing experience of being able to work on SARS in a BSL-3 laboratory. They have both entered the PhD program now. Carly McAllister also was uh, instrumental in a lot of this work and is continuing this work. She's a master's student who is now a research associate in my lab. And who I don't have here is Laura St. Clair, who uh, is a graduate student and also helping with several assays. Brian and David are my co, uh, co and my colleagues in the uh, in the antiviral effort. Uh, David is uh, the vice president for translation and helps with a lot of the MTAs and CDAs that and the paperwork and also on an advisory role. And Brian also helps on an advisory role. I'd like to uh, acknowledge funding. I'm a co-director of the Center for Metabolism of Infectious Disease, where we're really pursuing some of these futuristic ideas. The Office of Vice President for Research for their contribution to setting up the antiviral um, facility, and also the Betcher Foundation COVID Biomedical Research Innovation Grant. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Pereira, that was great. I would like to now introduce our second speaker, Dr. Suzanne Riches, who is a field application scientist here at Nexalon and one of our most popular speakers. For a complete biography on Dr. Riches, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Riches, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for the introduction, Lisa, and thank you to Dr. Pereira as well for a really, really nice talk. Um, I'll spend the next 15 minutes of the session just discussing some data from some other virology labs and show how we at Nexalom are modernizing traditional virology research. So um, the first time I presented on this topic um, was in May this year. And at that point, we were in the middle of a lockdown, at least in the UK, uh, due to COVID-19. And at that point, there were 5.6 million total confirmed cases globally and around 90,000 new cases per day happening. So globally, we were all pretty worried, but hopeful that the lockdown rules would mean that those numbers should start to come down and the infection rates should slow down as well. 
The situation now is that there have been over 50 million global cases in total, and the daily case rate is at 600,000 cases per day. Um, there are, of course, a lot of reasons for this data other than simply the enhanced spread of the virus. Um, more regular and reliable testing across the world is being one of those reasons why the data um, is a lot higher. But really, my main point here is that we're still in the midst of a pandemic, and the faster we can conduct um, vitally important virology research will equal the faster production of validated vaccines and efficient treatments. And it's really great news this week about the Pfizer and BioNTech collaboration um, creating the vaccine. So there is a lot of fantastic research going on all over the world at the moment, and it's difficult to summarize that in just one slide, but I wanted to try and summarize um, specifically the ongoing laboratory research. Um, and I've tried to summarize that into a few main categories. The screening of antiviral drugs and the screening of new vaccines are the two major areas that are spoken about on a regular basis, but there's also some other areas as well researching the pathogenesis of the virus itself, regarding things like replication cycle and virus spread can be a really big help. Another arm of virology research will be to monitor the immune response in relation to vaccines and antivirals. So this area of study sort of goes hand in hand with the others. Evaluation of preclinical models and, of course, the processing of all the diagnostic tests and the creation of accurate diagnostic tests are um, other major areas of laboratory research. So following on from this, my next question is what experiments are these labs routinely performing to get the data that they need? So within the typical COVID-19 in vitro uh, virology lab, there are a few key cell-based experimental techniques that are used. And the technique that has really stood the test of time is the lytic plaque assay. A variation of that plaque assay is the focus formation assay. And these clusters of infected fluorescent cells or foci can be analyzed in a similar way to the lytic plaque assay. Uh, cytopathic effect, that experiment is an assessment of the host cell monolayer and is normally determined by quantifying the percentage of host cells still alive after infection. Infectivity and neutralization assays are probably the most common application I've seen in the virology labs and will simply determine what percentage of the total host population are infected. And the neutralization aspect then comes when you add an antibody into the experiment in order to block that infection. T cell activation is just one of many examples of ways we can gain more knowledge on how the immune cells are responding to vaccines and antivirals. And finally, all of the above experiments can be done in conjunction with looking at cytotoxicity, proliferation, or morphology changes of the cells. Uh, Dr. Pereira showed some really nice uh, fluorescent images of virus infectivity and some cytotoxicity. Um, so I would like to focus on a couple of the other applications in the list to show you how we at Nexalom are helping to progress research in these areas. So before I show you some data, I wanted to mention some of the more classical methods of doing these experiments. Flow cytometry is a method that will give you really great sensitivity, allow lots of flexibility when it comes to using multiple fluorophores. However, the speed of this method is slow. There is extra maintenance required, large sample volumes, etc., meaning that um, if you are doing screening using this method, um, it's going to take a very long time. And that time to get results for our current COVID situation is something that we need to reduce as much as we can. Manual microscopy is still um, a gold standard in a lot of assays and experiments, but the very slow speed coupled with no way really of easily analyzing your images um, after taking them, um, again, means that doing any type of screening using this method is pretty impossible. So we're really excited that so many virology labs are now adopting image cytometry technology for these kind of assays and the ones I previously mentioned. 
So the Soligo by Nexalom is the image, image cytometer you can see in the middle. Um, of the slide there. And to summarize it as briefly as I can, it's a multi-channel fluorescent and bright field microscope plus automatic stage movement, allowing images to be automatically focused and captured from well to well um, and in multiple channels as well. Um, plus, the Soligo is coupled with automatic analysis software to produce quantitative data based on those images. Uh, the points I really love about the Soligo are that um, uh, they're made to enable you to image your cells within your plates with no disruption. So those cells can be live or they can be fixed. Uh, they need very little maintenance. I'm talking about the Soligo machines now. There's no fluidics, no contamination, and they're really easy to operate. And they're really fast. So compared to a flow cytometer or manual microscope, high throughput experiments will be completed in a, in a fraction of the time. Um, and in addition to this, you'll also get beautiful, really nice publication worthy images to back your data up. So now I'd like to go through some data um, and images you can expect to see on the Soligo. So I wanted to start with the most classical of all the virology applications, a lytic plaque assay. For this example, Vero cell monolayers were infected with a virus and then incubated for 36 hours. The monolayers were then fixed and stained with crystal violet. Quantifying the number of lytic plaques per well was previously done manually by eye by this lab. So they used to hold their plate up to the light to try and count how many plaques were in there. Uh, but our aim was to use the Soligo um, and it was to look at an earlier time point than they're currently doing and to save them that overall experimental time. So this is the normal point. The group would count lytic plaques by eye, which is the 36 hour time point. This can be done by image cytometry methods too. And I can show you um, a zoomed in image here. The green segmentation on the right, um, they outline each lytic plaque. And I'm just showing you here how the image cytometer analysis software detects each of those plaques, even when plaques are merging. Um, the settings can still be optimized to count accurately. Um, and these merging plaques would be really difficult to see by eye. Remembering this is in a 12-well 12 12 plate. This is a single well. Um, it's going to cause a lot of user-to-user -user variability if you try and count the plaques in a well looking like this. Even at lower virus concentrations, like in this second well, uh, there will still be merging plaques, which can be interpreted differently uh, by various individuals when counting manually by eye. Um, and using the image cytometer, the Soligo, means you can enlarge these images and get a better understanding of whether this is indeed uh, two merging plaques or just one single plaque. And ultimately, it will give you really accurate and consistent analysis. So we can also consider that earlier experimental time point where plaques would not normally be able to be quantified by eye. So this is exactly the same plate. This is just 24 hours earlier than the previous images. Um, what we can see here, you can just about see the plaques in those images there. Um, on the right hand side, the green fill option is, um, is activated. That's a analysis option on the Soligo, just allowing you to see what plaques have been identified. And we can just see that all those, even those small plaques can be identified nice and accurately on the Soligo. So to summarize this experiment, image cytometry enables you to detect the plaques earlier, which means a whole day of experimental time is now saved. In addition, extra data showing the average size of those plaques is also available and automatically calculated, which could definitely not be something that you do by eye. Uh, and finally, um, there's been so many labs that I've gone into where I've seen walls, uh, mountains of plaque plates stacked up. But with the Soligo, all of your images are digitally archived. So there's no need for these uh, walls of plates anymore.
So if you wanted to see some published data um, on just this, then there's a publication from Biogen. It's a good place to start. Biogen are a gene therapy company in Boston um, and who now automate their plaque assays using image cytometry in order to increase the speed, throughput, sensitivity and robustness of their assays. Okay, my, uh, my next experiment example is one where cytopathic effect is the readout. Now, cytopathic effect, it can come in lots of shapes and sizes, but the most common measurement performed is to quantify the percentage of remaining host cell monolayer after a number of days of incubation with the virus of interest. So in this experiment, we have some host cells that were plated out and then infected with EMCV. And after incubation, the remaining host cell monolayers were stained with crystal violet. Um, it's also important just for me to mention here that the with the Saligo, you don't have to stain the cells to assess the monolayer. You can do that without a stain. Uh, the reason it was done, it was to compare by eye to a manual scoring method to see if the results were comparable. So here are some of the whole well images from this experiment. On the left, at low virus concentration, we can see the dark staining of the monolayer of host cells, uh, which is showing that the monolayer is still alive and intact when the virus concentration is low. But with increasing virus concentration, the host cell monolayer becomes depleted. So that's as you move from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Uh, results are automatically quantified as a percentage of host cells remaining in each well, which um, in this example um, contains serial dilutions as you move across the plate. We can see the results presented as a heat map on the left-hand side, that's um, all within the Saligo software. And after exporting the data, we can plot that uh, to produce viral titer curves and determine TCID 50s. The lab that this data is from are now using this exact same method, um, uh, this exact same technique for their COVID-19 research. And each plate um, that you do with this technique takes just five minutes to scan and to analyze. So as I mentioned before, CPE comes in many shapes and sizes and the flexibility of the um, analysis software of the Saligo um, will allow you to analyze these in different ways. So uh, this is an example from one of our collaborators who are currently working on antivirals uh, for COVID-19. So firstly, like in the example previously, we can simply assess the depletion of the monolayer. So the green fill here isn't um, fluorescence, it's just the fill analysis option on the Saligo and it just shows you where cells are present, where cells are still present within that well. An alternative option is to count the total number of cells in each well. So CPE will be indicated here by an overall reduction in the number of cells. Uh, these cells are represented by the small green dots um, within that image. And a final way of doing it is um, another, just a slightly different alternative would be to determine the CPE from looking at the morphology of the cells. So the rounding up of cells could be an indication of infection and cells dying. And this difference in morphology from the healthy cells can be quantified. And in this image here, the more round cells in the monolayer are indicated by a red cross. And if you'd like to see a fluorescent alternative examining CPE, then researchers from the J. Craig Ventner Institute are measuring CPE using a green signal to show where healthy host cells remain after viral infection. Just my last couple of slides now. Um, with uh, with those feature with these features and the data I presented in mind, I just wanted to summarise the advantages and the feedback we have been getting from current Saligo users who are doing COVID nineteen research and those working on other viruses too. So the points in this slide I really wanted to focus on um, are the getting results earlier and the finishing projects faster. One group I know uh, were previously doing their infectivity and neutralization assays on a flow cytometer. For a small screen, this would take around one week to complete the scan and to get all the data. And now with the Saligo, they can get the same data, the same amount of data, and it's all comparable in just four hours. 
So if you extrapolate that further, it will mean that candida antivirals and vaccines make their way to animal models and then ultimately into the clinic a lot faster. And considering there's currently 600,000 new cases per day globally, I think this time saving, especially for COVID research, is absolutely vital. Um, and a great example of this type of screening um, is happening in relation to COVID-19 by groups at Sanford Burnham and at Mount Sinai performing, um, and this paper just shows their drug repurposing screen that they did. Um, without going into too much detail, they started with 12,000 compounds and narrowed it down to 17 to take further. And this was done using a combination of image cytometry with other methods as well. So before we go to questions, I just also wanted to mention our newest instrument, the Celica MX. It's a high throughput cell counter, which will evaluate 24 cell samples in less than three minutes. So that's a total of less than three minutes, um, which is really relieving cell counting bottlenecks in high throughput labs. So if you wanted to hear any more about the Celica, there's not much time in this talk, but please indicate that um, at the end. Um, and thank you very much for your time and attention. Thanks, Suzanne. Another great presentation. Uh, I, it's time for Q&A. So if you have any questions, please enter them in the question box. And I already have a couple to start. Um, it's great news to hear about progress with COVID-19 vaccine using mRNA approach. As an expert in the field, what are your thoughts? Also, should we be looking at multi-pronged approaches? And do you think your metabolic approach could improve the predictability of an efficacious treatment? Efficacious treatment? Yes. Yes, I can take that. Um, definitely, we have to um, employ a multi-pronged approach. Uh, not every vaccine is going to be um, effective and long-term. And so I think that uh, evaluating multiple candidates is really important and having options. Um, the metabolic uh, landscape for sure is important in, term, in terms of determining efficacy. So uh, especially I think it becomes important when people have diabetes or heart disease or metabolic syndrome, which has shown to exacerbate um, COVID-19 uh, morbidity. So, I, and most of those, uh, Conditions are due to meta metabolic disruption in your body, mainly glucose metabolism. And so it's really important to determine how your immune response uh, is altered by the presence of elevated um, metabolic uh, disruptions. Okay. So this next one has a really long comment with it. Um, they say, it is a really interesting, congratulations, Dr. Pereira and Dr. Riches. I have always believed that medicine should be individualized due to all the different environments we have within our own body. I'm a medic on a biomaterials materials laboratory PhD program. I'm really sad every day I hear a professor dies due to the virus. I want to research about material for improved face masks here in the laboratory. I've been reading about inducing a dipole mo moment of the virus with an ele electrostatic charged material. For both, on your experience, what would be the proper option to measure, measure the interaction of the virus to a surface fiber? Is there any nanoparticle? Last time I read about ZN nanoparticles. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. Um, I, can, I can comment on this and maybe Suzanne can help as well. Um, we have been testing um, some materials, um, just by looking at uh, what what is left after incubating the virus with the materials. Um, I think, uh, I'm not sure what the best method is to really uh, measure, um, but it uh, measure virus binding. Uh, the bioco instruments and other analytical instruments that look at um, biophysical principles uh, of binding, I think would be the best option. Uh, of course, you can't do SARS, live SARS with it, but you could do uh, proteins with it. Suzanne, do you have any um, thoughts on it? 
Yeah, thanks, Dr. Pereira. This, this is um, slightly outside of my um, expertise, but I, one thing I would say is if you have access to any kind of imaging systems, um, it's not just cells that you can image. You can look at other um, 3D uh, materials in there as well um, and look at protein binding and things like that using fluorescence within those materials. Um, so if you have, it doesn't have to be a Soligo, if you have some sort of imaging platform um, in your laboratory, um, we can help advise on um, on how you would image those um, those materials then with the uh, virus added as well. Yeah, I think uh, the Saligo actually would be perfect because you could put the material down on a plate and you could put the virus on and then wash it several times and uh, probe the plate with uh, antibodies against viral proteins and image it using the Saligo. Great idea. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's definitely what we could do with the Saligo. It would be really interesting to see as well. Okay. Uh, next question is, we don't see many 3D models in virology research. Does proper polarization of cells matter for an in vitro models? Um, so we do have 3D models of viruses, but um, I'm not sure if you're asking about 3D cell culture. Uh, some viruses definitely uh, replicate better in polarized cells. Uh, I'm not sure if SARS does or not, um, but definitely three-dimensional um, cell culture models are probably the way to go in, in the future. Uh, they are difficult to establish and maintain, uh, especially with consistency. Um, but I think it's critical that we look at cell-cell interactions and how they might impact virus infection and any therapeutic intervention. Okay. Uh, the next question is, um, is there a downside to performing micro-neutralization assays in 384 well plates? I can, I think I can answer that. Um, I think as long as you have enough material, as long as you have a significant amount of cells um, and it's been tested and you have replicas, then there's uh, no reason, I don't think, why you can't miniaturize your assays. If you do miniaturize from, let's say you go from a 96 to a 384 well plate for those kind of assays, um, you're going to get more replicas and more data. Um, so I'd actually recommend doing something, at least testing it out to see if you can get consistent results um, in that miniature format. Okay, uh, the next question is a kind of a broad question. Should we rely on a COVID vaccine or should we be thinking about combining this with antiviral drugs too? So in uh, traditionally, antivirals have been given after you get sick and you go to the hospital. So I think we need to focus to make sure that that uh, has capacity. So a lot of the antivirals that are being developed are to uh, treat after infection. We do have the option of uh, treating prior to infection and certainly uh, that has to be investigated. Um, I think the vaccine vaccines have historically proven to be incredibly effective at reducing infection. Uh, so, Definitely a combination does help, but um, my, um, I think my uh, confidence in vaccines is high, uh, especially with the kind of technologies and the effort scientists around the world are uh, putting towards COVID vaccines. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I think just to add to that, there's um, with this particular vaccine that's just come out, there's a, um, it's really exciting, um, but there's still a lot of data we need to um that needs to come out you know is it working in those people that get the severe form of the disease we don't know yet is there any after effects um beyond um a couple of months we don't know yet um it does it affect does it um does it stop people getting the virus for longer than a couple of months? We don't know. We don't know yet. It hasn't been tested. Um, also, although it's super exciting, I still think we should be uh, not giving up on ev all the other research that's going on out there in terms of antivirals and other vaccines as well, because we just don't know um, 
what the at the end result for this one is going to be. Okay. Uh, this person says, thank you for your, this incredible presentation. As both presenters mentioned that with technological process, progress, the time and laboratory processes are reduced. I can't help but wonder how the newer generations can prepare for such an automated environment. How can we gain more experience on such automated processes? And this person's asking as a biomedical sciences undergraduate. So I can uh, take a uh, take, uh, attempt answering it, and then Suzanne, you can help. <laughs> um, I think uh, I think there is a significant amount of human uh, input that's required for automated processes. Uh, there's a lot of decision making in the upfront of the experiment that is. Uh, important uh, to be and to be a good scientist to be able to design the experiment well. Uh, the automated processes are basically helping you to speed up things that uh, like readouts or uh, analysis or measurements. Uh, what you get at the end are results which have to be critically evaluated by scientists as well. Um, undergraduates are have to um, really explore opportunities. I have a lot of undergraduates in my lab and they have a phenomenal experience because they get trained to work in a BSL-2 lab. And if they are good uh, and dedicated, then they get to work in a BSL-3 lab. And so there's lots of opportunities for undergraduates and they should all try to join a research lab and get some experience. Yeah, I don't have too much to add to that. I just absolutely agree that the automated processes are going to help you get from A to B, but planning that process also needs to be done. I just think that's exactly what I would say, that it doesn't, um, it doesn't take away the, um, the science and the thinking about why you're going from A to B. You need to still do all of that work as well. Great advice. Um, so the, the last question I have here is an interesting one. Uh, what are your thoughts on the mink variety of COVID found in Denmark? Should we be concerned? And do you think the current vaccine approach uh, would work with that variation? Oh, I, I'm not familiar with the... Um, variety of COVID found in Denmark? <laughs> Does anyone else know? <laughs> yeah, I can, um, I, I'm familiar with it, but um, I, I, I don't think I can comment on what, on species to species um, uh, viability of the vaccine, whether it will work. Um, I don't think, unfortunately, I don't think um, the animal models of the virus um, are, pro are a priority for the researchers at the moment. And I don't think mink is something that they would have tested anything in prior to it going into humans either. So um, I have no idea. M maybe. One you don't them think there's any trial studies going on in minks? I think people are, uh, I know my colleague next door is going after, going to collect uh, some of the viruses in the minks. Um, and um, all the people studying animal models are certainly going to test it out. But what should be uh, appreciated is that there's always going to be a quasi-species. So you're not getting one virus particle, you're getting a family. Right, and that family has a relationship to each other. So a lot of these vaccines and antivirals will um, be effective against a quasi-species because that's what really, even in cell culture, you're not, you don't have a single species. You do have a collection of virus particles that are slightly different to each other. So um, the drugs and the vaccines are really measuring that. But of course, there will be larger variations and that we have to address that. I did have one more question come in. Um, they say great presentations and are there any suggestions for how to analyze metabolites with cell-based assays or traditionally mass spec? Right, so we, uh, we use um, mass spec 
which is the most powerful way to analyze metabolites. But you can also analyze metabolites uh, using cell-based assays. For instance, you know, you have a cholesterol test and you have a glucose test. Uh, so there are lots of tests out there for um, different metabolites. They're the more generic metabolites. A lot of the metabolites that we study uh, when we look at a whole human uh, or maybe serum saliva or urine of an uh, organism is uh, a collection of metabolites. And the way the, uh, the field is moving and the way we are pushing the field is to really identify groups of metabolites that uh, identify a disease, that are biomarkers of a disease. So for instance, if you want to know if a patient who just got infected with SARS is going to have severe disease or maybe mild disease, there might be a signature in the saliva or urine or the serum that might indicate that. So it's not just one or two metabolites, but it's really a group of metabolites. Okay, that concludes our questions that we have for today. And um, we appreciate you taking the time to attend today's presentation. We ask that you complete a short survey at the close of this webinar your thoughts and comments would be greatly appreciated. May you make sure you visit the poster hall and the exhibit booths where you can learn more about a variety of exciting technologies, including some of the ones shared during today's presentation. This webcast has been recorded and will be available to view it on demand through July of 2021. Everybody have a really great day. Thank you. Thank you.